Our first speaker this morning is Professor Richard Lynn. Uh, he got his PhD at Cambridge, and then for a time he worked at the Dublin Institute of Economic and Social Research, but his Thatcherite policies didn't mesh particularly well with the thinking down there. And he moved to the University of Ulster. Uh, he has recently retired and is now a director of the Ulster Institute of Social Research, where he continues to do the kind of work that uh, has distinguished his career in psychology. Uh, he is the author of an excellent book that was reviewed in American Renaissance called Dysgenics, Genetic Deterioration in Modern Populations. And he's just completed the manuscript of a volume we look forward to with great anticipation. It's called Eugenics, A Reappraisal. Uh, probably the, his uh, greatest contributions to the field have been his 1978 uh, discovery, if you will, of the high IQ of uh, the North Asians. Uh, his first population for investigation was the Japanese, and his discovery of this 105 IQ for North Asians. Uh, not too surprisingly, this discovery was not very well received in uh, the community. The expectation being that uh, if you were going to start moving up in numbers from the 100 figure, there was a possibility you might move down. And in fact, uh, some of his subsequent research has determined uh, the African IQ on general to be at a level of, of 70. So the people who had their swords out and were sharpening them back in 1978 uh, turned out to be correct. But uh, these are the conclusions to which an unbiased appreciation of facts lead us. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the podium Richard Lynn, who will speak about race, European developments. <clears throat> Thank you, Jared. Um, <clears throat> it's a great pleasure for me to attend my first AR conference and an honor to be invited to speak to you. Uh, the growing transformation of your society in the United States into a multiracial and multicultural society has also been occurring in Europe, although not on such an extensive scale. Nevertheless, we are catching up with you and fully expect to uh, <clears throat> a growing increase of the numbers of our immigrant population in the decades in the decades that lie ahead. <clears throat> uh, all the major European countries uh, in the European community have quite significant recent immigrant populations, uh, many of which come from non-European countries. Um, the percentages range from around 5% to a maximum of 12% in Sweden. These are official statistics gathered from census returns and are certainly underestimates of the true numbers since many immigrants are illegals or for various reasons do not fill in census returns. And it's quite hard to estimate how many unknown uh, immigrants escape these census data, but probably should add two or three percent to the official figures. <clears throat> these immigrants are of various kinds, depending largely on the historical ties with the countries to which they've immigrated. So France has a number of black immigrants from its former Caribbean colonies and its former African colonies and from uh, Algeria. Uh, we in Britain have large numbers of immigrants from our former colonies in Africa and India and uh, <clears throat> in Malaysia and so forth. As a generalization, these immigrants have not, for the most part, adapted well to European culture. They have high levels of crime and uh, high levels of unemployment, with the exception of uh, relatively small numbers of Asian immigrants who are rather conspicuously different from those from Africa in these regards. I'm going to talk here particularly about Britain, uh, where uh, I know the data much more extensively than I do for continental Europe. <clears throat> Britain was a wholly white country up to the <clears throat> uh, Second World War. 
And it is only after the war that Britain and uh, the rest of Western Europe began to experience large-scale immigration from uh, non -Europe, of non-European peoples. The way this came about was uh, essentially in the same way it came about in the United States through the passing of an act of parliament which allowed immigrants to enter the country. And uh, the crucial act of parliament in Britain was passed in 1948 and is called the British Nationality Act. And the provision of this act was to give citizenship of the United Kingdom to all the inhabitants of our extensive colonies. A huge number of people in Africa, in the Indian subcontinent and elsewhere around the globe, approaching a, a, a billion people. And it's very extraordinary, I think, in retrospect, that such an act could have been passed allowing all these people citizenship and right of abode in Britain. And it's very curious that it was, there was so little discussion and protest when this uh, act was going to a parliament. Hardly anyone said, hang on a minute, uh, this is really a sensible idea to allow all these people to come and live in Britain. And a few people who raised these queries were brushed aside. Very much, it's very much a, a precursor of your 1965 Act, where much the same thing happened. A few people raised objections. It's a, a lot of people were going to come in under the provisions of this Act, and no one took much notice of this. So it was in Britain. Nevertheless, no sooner had the Act been passed than immigrants began to arrive in Britain, largely from our Caribbean colonies as they were at that time and from the Indian subcontinent. It was in the rather later that uh, they used to come in, they came in from Africa. So they began coming in throughout the 1950s and um, the Conservatives won the election and took office in 1952 and it is uh, <clears throat> uh, I think one can legitimately blame the Conservatives for not doing anything to stem the increasing numbers of immigrants who came in during the 50s. This was discussed, but it was thought it would raise too many problems, and uh, the Labour Party were a key, it was a keen party of immigration at this time, and um, for various reasons, perhaps simply through inertia, nothing was done about it. Uh, it began to be apparent, in, as quite substantial numbers of these immigrants came in, that the, our black immigrants were a different class of immigrant from our Indian immigrants. Indian immigrants adjusted quite well to life in Britain, uh, both economically, they worked and uh, set up businesses, and, uh, did well in school and um, didn't, didn't, did not commit crimes, whereas the blacks, uh, on the contrary, had high levels of unemployment and uh, did commit crimes on a more extensive scale than uh, either whites or Asians. And our first ra ra race riots broke out uh, in 1958 in the Notting Hill area of London and also in the city of Nottingham, very much like your race riots in that you experience from time to time in the United States when blacks go on the rampage and destroy buildings and uh, break into shops and loot the merchandise. And uh, these riots were a black phenomenon. They were, you know, Asians don't riot in Britain, uh, as they don't in the United States. Um, <clears throat> they were a black phenomenon. So, uh, so it began, it became increasingly evident that we, as it were, saddled ourselves with a social problem. And there was more and more pressure within the Conservative Party to do something to stop this immigration, which was in fact done, or at least it was attempted in 1962 with an Immigration Act, which um, brought an end to what we call primary immigration. We distinguish between the primary immigration, which is the immigration of those people who would just like to come and live in our country, uh, who are also known as economic migrants. We distinguish between this primary immigration and secondary immigration, which is all other kinds of immigration, which is the three main kinds consisting of dependents of those who are already in, their wives and so on, 
um, illegals and uh, asylum seekers. <clears throat> so this act put an end to primary immigration. And at that time, the 1961 census revealed that there were approximately um, 200,000 blacks in black immigrants in Britain and approximately 130,000 Indians. And uh, the act provided that these people who are mainly young men were allowed to bring in their dependents, wives, and uh, many of these people left their wives and dependent children in their home countries. They reckon to establish themselves in Britain, find accommodation and so on, and then bring their wives and children over. So this was permitted under the 1962 Act. <clears throat> Nevertheless, people were reasonably optimistic uh, that this would really bring an end to substantial immigration. A certain number of dependents would obviously come in, but nevertheless, we'd pretty well solve the problem. At that time, uh, the Labour Party bitterly opposed this Immigration Act. Parties to the left are normally pro-immigration, pro-multicultural societies, and parties of the political right are um, antagonistic to these things, and so it was in Britain in the early 1960s. So the Labour Party bitterly opposed this act, but they revised their opinions, or at least their political postures, in uh, 1964, when there was a general election, and one of the uh, Conservative candidates in the city of Birmingham and in the ward of Smithwick, a candidate by the name of Griffiths, Conservative candidate fought his election campaign under the slogan, if you want a nigger for your neighbor, vote Labour. So <clears throat> posters with this slogan were printed and uh, shown in placards over the, city, over the war, over the constituency, shown in people's uh, people in their windows and so forth. And he won a resounding electoral victory which, uh, from which the Labour Party drew the conclusion that there were no votes to be gained. On the contrary, a lot of votes to be lost in being a pro-immigration party. So they uh, decided to go with the 1962 Act. So come the middle 60s, people were uh, reasonably happy with the situation. Uh, we thought that uh, we made a blunder by passing this 1948 Act, allowing these people to come in, but nevertheless they were here. There weren't all that many of them. They were bringing their dependents, but there wouldn't be all that many of these once the dependents came in. We could uh, live with the situation, as it were. However, it turned out that uh, many more people, uh, dependents, came in than had been anticipated. Uh, partly, these were what might be called genuine dependents. They were, in fact, the wives and children of existing immigrants. And partly they were what might be called fake dependents, um, particularly from the Indian subcontinent. Uh, children would be brought in, um, purporting to be the children of uh, immigrants who'd established residence here, but they weren't really. And um, there was a big business in arranged marriages, which are traditional among Indians, by which. Uh, Indians who'd established residence in Britain would marry other Indians through family networks in the Indian subcontinent and would bring in their wives. And there was much more of this uh, immigration of dependents than it had been anticipated. <clears throat> so it seemed as the 60s wore on, the problem had not been solved. Uh, so uh, finally, as people, many people had hoped it would have been, um, now, in 1968, um, we had a rather, what I think is a unique event in, throughout the Western world, that a major mainstream politician made a big public stand, took a big public stand on the issue of the, in 1968, a uh, major mainstream politician uh, named Enoch Powell, of, uh, as you no doubt many of you have anticipated, took a, a public stand on the immigration issue, declared in a speech that uh, this was a disaster and uh, or it, would, it would simply, es the numbers of immigrants would escalate, uh, whole cities would be racially transformed, 
Uh, he pointed specifically to your experience in the United States uh, of the great cities in which whites are an increasing minority. And uh, he painted the future in quite dramatic, um, <clears throat> quite dramatic language. Um, it's, become, it's become known as the rivers of blood speech, or quite often as the infamous rivers of blood speech, uh, because he said in it, uh, he was a classical scholar, so he had a lot of classical uh, allusion at his disposal. He said in the course of each, like, like the Roman, uh, I am full of foreboding. I seem to see the river Tiber foaming with much blood. As he predicted civil strife between the races uh, in the years that lie ahead. He said, he said uh, I, how did it come about that we allowed this to happen? We are like a population who have been busy building our own funeral pyre. And then he, uh, quoting a Greek aphorism, he said, those whom the gods seek to destroy, they first make mad. And that uh, we must indeed have been mad to pass this act and to, have, uh, to, con be, to continue to be allowing immigrants to come in through the dependency uh, rule. And the only solution to this problem is to repatriate them. We need a large scale problem, maybe a large scale program of repatriation to persuade them, pay them, we'll pay them to go home. We had a very dramatic impact on the population. And we had this perhaps curious reaction that the, the population as a whole were very much behind the sentiments of this speech. So a poll, uh, an opinion poll was carried out shortly after it, which found that 74% of the population agreed with this. And the London dockers came out on the march through the streets of London with placards which bore the legend, Enoch for PM, Prime Minister. So the population were very much behind him, but of course the intelligentsia and the politicians were, didn't like this at all. So, uh, the party leader was Edward Heath at this time. Uh, the Conservatives were in opposition, but he dismissed uh, Enoch Powell from what we call the shadow cabinet. Um, and um, he became, I suppose, a pariah in his own party. Well, um, as uh, more and more immigrants arrived, people began to do research on the kind of what you might call the, initially the impressions that the public had that the Asian immigrants were of a much better quality of immigrant than the black immigrants. This wasn't, as a matter of fact, surprising to many of the older generation in Britain who had had experience in running our colonial empire, much of which was in sub-Saharan Africa and much of which was in the Indian subcontinent. And the, uh, <clears throat> the style of administration of our empire was that we put our own nationals in the top command positions, the head of the art, local armies, the police forces, the civil service, and, uh, but we'd recruit local people for middle management and lower junior management uh, positions. And the same is true in private industry. People would, uh, whites would come out and run, actually run the businesses like the tea plantations in, Africa, in, in, in India and the um, tobacco plantations and cotton plantations in Africa. But they'd employ local natives, as they were called in those days to uh, do the work and to occupy middle management positions. Now we found through experience of running this, uh, the empire of this kind for a <clears throat> century and a half or so, that this worked quite well in India. You could appoint Indians to these positions and they were good. They were perfectly good at doing these things. <clears throat> but you, we couldn't do this in Africa. It was no use appointing Africans to these positions because they couldn't do it. And so our solution to this problem was to import Indians into Africa to do this, to do these jobs. And uh, that was how it was that quite large numbers of Indians were imported into South Africa, where there still remain as a uh, quite a large population and uh, do well. And uh, into East Africa, in um, Kenya and Uganda, 
um, brought in quite a lot of Indians there who uh, also did, did uh, the middle management, junior management, white collar jobs, and um, many of them set up businesses and did well until they were, of course, expelled by, from Uganda by Idi Amin around 1966, <clears throat> after which the country has not done nearly so well. So uh, it wasn't really surprising, this uh, general impression that people had that the Asians were, do, were adapting quite well, uh, to, uh, blacks weren't adapting nearly so well. But you know, as the 60s, as we got into the age later 60s, people began to do, uh, social scientists began to do research on this question to get out the facts and figures um, for various uh, in indices of adjustment of the society to our society. Well, one of the first of these was an inquiry which the Ministry of Education made in the uh, late 1960s of the numbers of uh, children of different ethnic groups who had uh, who are found to be ineducable in schools. So there's a certain proportion of children who are in schools who are ineducable because they're mentally retarded or borderline mentally retarded. Come the age of nine or ten, they haven't learned to read or do simple arithmetic. And we have special schools, as you do in the States, for such children to ascertain, diagnosed, their IQs measured. And they are put, uh, sent to these, what we call, educationally subnormal schools, or schools for the education of subnormal. This inquiry found that over the country as a whole, that the blacks were being, black children were being referred, being sent to these schools four, hundred, four times more than would be expected on the basis of the numbers in the population, uh, as compared with whites and uh, Asians. And, uh, in 19, this was just one indication of the poor performance of the black children in schools, which began to be increasingly evident. In about the mid-1970s, the government set up a commission to inquire into this problem and its causes. And uh, it took a long time to produce its report. Very, uh, racial minorities were represented on this commission and it was hard to get any agreement among them as to what the causes, among the commission as a whole, what the causes were. But a, uh, uh, an appendix to the report was a study carried out by uh, Nicholas McIntosh, who is professor of psychology at Cambridge, into the intelligence of uh, the different racial groups and this appendix said uh, that uh, it produced evidence, uh, which perhaps we could show in the first transparency here. <coughs> well, these are, the, <coughs> these are the results that uh, Macintosh produced, showing that the, um, the black children had an IQ of 88.2, uh, the Asians um, of 97.7 uh, uh, in relation to uh, a white IQ of 100. And um, discussing these, he said, well, it's really, it's quite straightforward why blacks don't do well at school and are intelligent, they're not so intelligent as whites, so they wouldn't expect them to do so well at school. Um, there have been a number of other studies done in Britain, they all produce very much the same kind of result. The, the blank IQ is a little bit higher than you find in the United States, where it's around 94, 95, oh, sorry, 84, 85. This is almost certainly due to a selective immigration effect, that it's a, the, the, the brighter, uh, these are mainly Caribbeans, um, some coming from India, from, from Sub-Saharan Africa, but it tends to be the brighter ones who migrate to England. Uh, so they have slightly higher IQs than uh, those who are left behind, or the, those who are in the United States who, um, <coughs> who aren't self-selected migrants. And uh, as the um, years rolled on, various studies were done of similar uh, expressions of uh, adjustment to the society. In the last um, 10 years or so, we in England have, uh, as a means of dealing with the problem of educational standards in schools have uh, 
institute a system by which we test all six-year-olds and then nine-year-olds and 13-year-olds, test them out of the country and um, for their educational attainment. So that um, partly we have the facts and figures of the, on this matter, and partly as uh, uh, teachers, I mean, princ school principals, head teachers can be warned, and you know, people in children in our school aren't doing very well, or this particular child isn't doing very well. We have a kind of national yardstick against which to measure both group, the performance of schools, and the performance of individual children. So I'll show you in the next transparency the uh, the result of a recent, these tests take, tests take place once a year. Now we now come to divide our uh, immigrants into a more, more finely grained categories and um, into the blacks. So these are how official figures in the census and in social inquiries are normally presented. The blacks are divided into the Caribbean blacks uh, the African blacks into what is this called? Uh, other blacks who may be a mixture of both or black white, result of black white unions and so on. Um, so, as far as they're concerned, you see that uh, the, white, uh, the whites on the left hand bar do the best, uh, apart from the Chinese on the extreme right hand. We've got a small, smallest Chinese community in Britain, uh, about uh, 600,000. They do the best of all, as you can see there. It's very similar, of course, to your experience in the United States, where the Asian, particularly the, the Chinese and Japanese and Koreans, as distinct from um, Filipino, other, other South Asians, Filipinos, and uh, people from South East Asia. It's particularly these North Asians who do well. As your experience in the States, they, they, they score much higher on the mathematical section of the scholastic aptitude test, for example. Uh, it's hard to keep them out of the elite universities, particularly in computing and physics and mathematics and things, so they're so good. You've got exactly the same experience here. Even at the age of uh, six or seven, our Chinese immigrants are doing very well. Um, so the, none of the black, uh, the black, uh, the, all the blacks don't do so well as the whites. But you see that the those who are from uh, Black Africa do rather better than the other one, the other blacks than the black Caribbeans. The reason for that is there's been quite a substantial selective immigration factor from Black Africa. A lot of, a lot of our black Africans come as students, uh, run in universities, and then don't go back. Um, <clears throat> And uh, so we're kind of getting the elite of, uh, from black Africa, they didn't as well as white children, but they do better than the Caribbean um, children. <clears throat> Turning to the Indians, we have, um, we don't, oh, uh, by this time, uh, the Indians sometimes have split up into the three independent countries, of course, of India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. So we differentiate these three types of Indian uh, people from the subcontinent now. It's a general finding, which you see here, that the Indians do best of these three groups. And uh, well, they do actually as well as whites, as you can see, as they did an intelligence test we saw uh, some time earlier. But the um, <clears throat> Pakistanis and Bangladeshis don't do as well. It's not quite sure, we're not quite clear why that is. A lot of these Bangladeshis and Pakistanis are relatively recent immigrants who don't speak English yet and haven't really adjusted very well to society. Uh, so maybe that's um, a substantial factor, and they'll uh, uh, do better in due course. <clears throat> Time will tell, as, they, as people say. Well, now we also have um, public examinations, which all children take. Uh, in Europe, it's quite common to have public examinations, which children take in mid-adolescence, like the baccalaureate in France. And we have one which we call the General Certificate of Education which children, you know, adolescents take at the age of 16, they take these in you know, eight or nine academic subjects, and you get points for these. And these points can be added up to give you a total score. And I'll show you the results of that in our next transparency. These are aggregating the Asians into a single group um, in this public examination. Uh, a few years back, uh, the statistics are almost the same from one year to the next, uh, based on large, you know, there are about 700,000 
adolescents take these exams, you've got a very large sample size with quite reliable results from one year to another. So you'll see, it's really becoming quite repetitive, this, the, the whites and the Asians do pretty much the same, the Asians just do it slightly less well than the whites, but there's very little in it, and the blacks do rather substantially worse. Now, if we could show the next uh, transparency, please. Uh, here we see uh, men from different groups with university degrees, which were obtained from the 1991 census, which was our last major source of information about how the various racial groups in Britain are doing. And um, you see that 7% um, of whites have uh, university degrees here. This is the total population. Of course, university education has expanded a lot in recent years. So many more, it's not 7% it's not 7 of, uh, 20 year, of the 20-year-old cohort who are in university or 25-year-old cohort who have university degrees. These are, include uh, people where not many people went to university. Anyhow, you see that um, as against the standard of whites, um, rather few Caribbean blacks have university degrees, less than half, that's because uh, not very intelligent at any work school. But we have quite a lot of, quite a high rate of graduates among black Africans. This is because I was saying a few minutes earlier, a lot of these black, quite a substantial number of black Africans come in as students and obtain degrees and remain here. And the other blacks, about halfway between, is a kind of mixture of, Arab, of Caribbean blacks and African blacks. And then turning to the Indians, you see, uh, those in the subcontinent, you see the same patterns we saw in the, among the six-year-olds a little while ago. Um, the, uh, the Indians do well, um, slightly more university graduates than among whites, uh, but the Pakistanis and the Bangladeshis do not do so well. Can we show them the, the next transparency, please? Well, uh, the census also gave us data on the proportions, the percentages of the unemployed among these uh, different racial groups. And um, you see here against the yardstick of whites with 10.9% of unemployed. Well, you see at the other end of the right hand end of this uh, <coughs> diagram, the, uh, the Chinese have even fractionally less unemployed than the whites. It's just as another index of their good adjustment into, in the society. Uh, blacks have this rather high level of unemployment, 25% of them, a quarter of them are unemployed. You know, the Indians don't have, the unemployment level isn't very much greater than the whites. But the Pakistanis and the Bangladeshis, they also have these high levels of unemployment. Well, they don't speak English, as I was saying, so they're not very employable. Um, could we see the next slide, please? Well, here we move to Crime, there's a lot of interest, of course, has been a lot of interest in the States in the race differences in crime, which uh, Jared Taylor was, uh, published this excellent um, pamphlet, uh, uh, The Color of Crime, uh, setting out extensive and recent data. But of course, in the States, it's been known from various studies for quite a long time that uh, there was a high crime rate among blacks and um, there's not a very high, Asians don't commit crime much. And we have just the same experience here. These, these percentages are done, this, this, this particular data which is presented, uh, gone out by our home office, they, they set, they, they put white, whites as one as a standard against which to compare the other groups. So what the, what the bars mean is that for everyone white in prison, uh, among uh, black men, there's 6.1 blacks in prison. It's very much, very, very similar disproportion as you have in the States. Right? I think the numbers of blacks in prison is very close to a six, a 600 percent excess as uh, compared with whites. And it's even higher among black women. I haven't seen the, the racial, I don't think Jared in his collection broke down the uh, the sex differences, or as we have to say, the gender differences in crime in the United States, as I recall. But it's a curious finding that the black women are even more overrepresented in prison than black men. One of the major reasons for this is that blacks are heavily involved in the drug importation business. And they use black women as what are called mules. 
in, uh, in importing drugs. They go to the country where the drugs are obtainable with a, a, a black, young black woman and they slip the drugs into her suitcase and uh, she goes through the um, <coughs> immigration and custom controls where we employ sniffer dogs on quite an extensive scale, particularly on blacks coming from Nigeria or coming from uh, Thailand, uh, <coughs> Pakistan, where these uh, drugs are bought. Um, so it's the uh, young women who are the fall guys, as it were, during the, in these, uh, in importation of these drugs who are apprehended and sent to prison. And you'll see that the crime rates among Asian men and, uh, is uh, fractionally lower than among white men, as uh, indexed by their presence in prison. And among um, <coughs> black uh, women is very much lower. It's, uh, both, uh, I find it both surprising, when, when I was getting out these data for the purpose of this um, lecture, I was both you know, surprised and unsurprised that the, the, the data came out like this. Um, anyway, it's very unsurprising that uh, we should find these results because the blacks in uh, Britain are very much the same kind of people as blacks in the United States, and descendants of slaves that we, we took over in the 17th and 18th centuries, and we unloaded some of them in our Caribbean islands, and we took the rest on to the southern United States. So they're very much the same kind of people. It's not at all surprising that they should uh, display the same kind of behavioral characteristics and the same kind of intelligence as um, your blacks over here do. These crime um, differences by race are not wholly to be explained by intelligence differences, in my opinion, though uh, there are some who think otherwise, notably uh, Robert Gordon, the sociologist at Johns Hopkins. But um, these data were well analyzed by Richard Hernstein and Charles Murray in the bell curve, where they, um, they matched blacks and whites for intelligence. And when you, when you do that, they find that um, although the disparity between the races and crime rates diminishes, it does, it's by no means totally extinguished. And they found that when, when, when you match uh, blacks and whites for intelligence, blacks are still committing crimes two and a half times as much as whites. Uh, so it's partly the fact that they're less intelligent. But it's partly there's, a, partly there's something else which the Hernstein Murray just left open for, uh, he invited the people to solve this problem. And so there are, I think, what you might call broadly non-cognitive differences between the races as well as the intelligence differences. And uh, no one has really quite, uh, in my opinion, quite crystallized out what this is. Uh, Michael Levin discusses it in his book, My Race Matters, and he um, discusses the uh, the fact that blacks don't seem to have a capacity to delay gratification and uh, in terms of an economist concept of time preferences, blacks want things now, you know, they're not willing to delay. If they want something, it's in a shop window and like to grab it. You know, they're not willing to kind of delay, work for it and uh, pay for it. Uh, so several people have been, as it were, thinking around this issue of non-cognitive differences between the races which contribute to the crime difference. Another difference which has come quite striking in Britain is the difference in marriage, which I think we should have on the next uh, transparency. Uh, blacks don't marry. Blacks don't have a. Blacks have a low propensity to marriage. So they're not. A, they don't. They don't uh, take naturally to a marriage. You've uh, found this in the United States, uh, and it's exactly the same in Britain. Uh, here we have. Um, uh, last year's study, study survey was carried out in Britain in 1974, from which these data are taken. And these are just the percentages of adults under 60 uh, in these various racial groups who are married. And you see against the white standard of 60% who are married, and only 39% of blacks are married. Whereas uh, among the, um, these other races, the, uh, all, those on, all those on the Indian subcontinent are um, more, more likely to be married than whites and Chinese uh, fractionally more. Now, when I first looked at these data, uh, I thought, well, maybe it's just the blacks don't, uh, you know, don't actually go into the, uh, go through the ceremony and uh, have it all formalized. Maybe they cohabit, you know. But it turns out this isn't so. 
And we'll show this on the next transparency. Blacks don't enter into monogamous uh, male-female partnerships. Um, uh, we don't seem to have that, but... Um, uh, perhaps, perhaps you could take that off for a minute, I'll just... Uh, we may, we may, maybe they're out of order or whatever. But anyhow, the long and short of this is, black, even if you ask uh, these... If, if you ask them whether they're in a partnership, or whether they've ever been in a partnership, you get much lower percentages of blacks than you do of, all, of these other groups. And you have just the same, exactly the same thing in the States, and people have wondered why it is, and there's been quite the same discussion in the social science literature, why blacks aren't married. They marry, and then so much as uh, whites or Asians or Hispanics come to that. And people have various theories have inflated. Well, a prominent theory in the States is that there, there are not many marriageable black males. A lot of them are in prison or they're unemployed. So, but that is when this is... Uh, when this theory or purported explanation is examined closely, it doesn't really account for very much of it. There does seem to be some kind of natural, well, was more of a natural, to put it in a different way around, there's more of a natural propensity to marry, to marry, to, which just simply expresses the formation of a love relationship and of a monogamous pair bonding to produce children. This, this, this propensity is more strongly developed in whites and Asians, and it is in blacks, and it is in blacks, apparently. Um, and this is part of, uh, can be handled by uh, Professor Russian's uh, RK theory, that uh, uh, whites and Asians have a stronger in, in investment in, uh, in rearing children who are most effectively reared by monogamous males and females as a uh, male, uh, two ad adult males and females rearing children. Uh, and it is um, uh, the lone parent style of uh, having and rearing children, which is typical of blacks, both in the United States uh, and in Britain. Let's uh, have a look at the, uh, oh, sorry, we have found this. Uh, <laughs> you found, found the transparency for us. Yes, this, is, this just asks, uh, uh, well, this, uh, although, although blacks don't marry, they have children. And they, don't, they don't form uh, relationships even of any serious nature, they have children. Um, and our blacks are very much like your blacks in this regard. Uh, adolescent blacks have quite a lot of children, have children, so they don't have husbands or partners. And here you'll see uh, the proportion of uh, what would you call women to call women. <laughs> girls, <laughs> it's, uh, 16 and 19, who have dependent children, and 6% uh, of white girls of this age group have dependent children. 21% uh, of black girls do, Caribbean ones, uh, this particular inquiry, very, very few. Indians have a strong um, family. <clears throat> uh, a more stronger traditional um, family-based sexual morality than uh, whites do. And um, Pakistanis, that seems to be less so. Um, let, uh, perhaps we could shift on to... Um, uh, so this is the same kind of data. These are not teenagers, but all... Uh, all uh, women who are lone parents. Uh, and this picks up the same kind of phenomenon. The blacks aren't in monogamous relation, uh, relationships with men. They're lone parents much more than whites or Indians or Chinese. Uh, you'll see that 9.6% uh, of the uh, <clears throat> population are lone parents uh, are among whites, 28% among blacks. Thank you. Well, here is an economic index. So social economic class one is the professional or senior managerial classes, according to the way we um, categorize socioeconomic status, as you do here. And uh, this is uh, data from the 1991 census of uh, males of this age, 21, 49. You'll see that 12% uh, of whites are in this uh, class one and 5%. Um, Blacks and uh, uh, so this is the second generation. Now um, we have this rather interesting phenomenon that although a lot of, quite a lot of, quite appreciable numbers of blacks who come into Britain as immigrants from Africa come in as students and become professionals, as we saw some slides back. In the second generation, you get regression effects. 
and their children are not doing nearly as well as their fathers. You've had, you've, you've, this has been found in the United States as well, that uh, immigrant blacks do quite well, but their children regress, as we say in uh, genetics. It's, why this happens is a great mystery to sociologists and demographers, who, sociologists who study these phenomena. They can't understand why the first generation come in as graduates and professionals, the children don't do well, but these are quite well known in psychology and genetics as regression effects. You take any elite group, the children don't do as well as the parents. And particularly so among blacks, has been shown among um, for intelligence. You know, if you match um, blacks and whites for socioeconomic status and take the top socioeconomic status in, shown in the United States, black, the black children of professionals don't do it as well as the white children of professionals. So you're picking up the same phenomenon here in the second generation. And you'll see that, as I said, in the first generation, blacks from Africa are doing quite well. In the second generation, they've, they're not doing any better than. Uh, black Caribbeans, and you see black Indians doing quite well in uh, these kind of jobs. These, these kind of jobs don't include uh, small entrepreneurs, shopkeepers, in which, you know, restaurateurs and so forth, in which blacks are quite prominent, so they don't appear all that much in uh, socioeconomic class one. Can we show them the next, the next transparency, please? That's all, oh, right, thank you. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> Well, um, you see, uh, we've got quite a lot of data, not so extensive as yours in the States, on all these phenomena. Well, now, when Enoch Powell made his speech in 68, he predicted that uh, there would be, uh, the growth of numbers would continue, it would become uncontainable, whole cities would be transformed into uh, non-white cities. Um, and there would be increasing social conflict. And uh, even civil war, he predicted, between a racial civil war would appear in uh, due course. And many, of course, and the commentators scoffed at this idea. And I myself thought that this was perhaps going a bit over the top when I first read this prediction. But nevertheless, a lot of this has turned out exactly as Enoch Powell predicted it would. The numbers did grow, and they've grown really at um, an extraordinary rate. And um, <clears throat> I mentioned the 1961 census, uh, we found there were approximately a third of a million um, blacks and Indians combined, 200,000 blacks, 130,000 Indians. By the 1991 census, there were 900,000 blacks increase of four and a half fold, and there were one and a half million Indians, We've gone up from uh, 130,000 to one and a half million, more than a tenfold increase. So it's been a huge increase, uh, sort of taken together slightly over a tenfold increase over uh, this 30 year period. And uh, so I was right about that. They come in through, there are three major avenues of, um, getting into the country, partly they come as a dependence and as fake dependents. So significant numbers will come over and arrange marriages here. There are agencies set up this kind of thing in the immigrant community, we produced uh, someone who has nationality here. And it's, it's all very slackly policed and monitored by um, what I call registry offices in which you can go and be married. Uh, you just turn up with someone uh, who produces her British passport if you're a male or vice versa or female, they produce their British passport and you, they, they marry you and give you your marriage certificate and you, then you thereby acquire citizenship. And uh, this is done for a fee and a living is made out of it by uh, people who organize this kind of thing. So uh, quite a lot of coming in through is fake marriages. There is an extensive business in arranged marriages still with the Indian subcontinent. Uh, someone with, a, with a, um, a daughter here will arrange for her 20-year-old daughter or whatever, will arrange for her to be married through family networks with someone in uh, the Indian subcontinent so she get out and get married and then the husband can come in. Quite often these young women as they become uh, kind of uh, anglicized kick up when they're told that we've arranged a marriage for you out of Pakistan you're coming over next week to be married, and uh, a certain amount of complaint about this, but the Indians have their ways of dealing with these objections. 
may take them over on, uh, let's say we're going for a holiday or we're going to meet grandma. And when they get, when they get over in India or Pakistan or Bangladesh, they take our passport away and she put under great coercive pressure. And uh, so she goes through the ceremony and the man is brought back to England. And then there's an extensive uh, numbers of illegals come in in various ways. They come over as, uh, say, tourists or holiday makers and never go back or uh, come in under fake passports, that kind of thing. And then there's a growing problem of asylum seekers. We have uh, quite substantial numbers of asylum seekers. We've got about 70,000 asylum seekers, so-called asylum seekers, coming in a year. And each of these has to be processed. Their claim for asylum has to be examined to see whether it's uh, legitimate and acceptable. If, it's, if they're turned down, as they're not being, they're not deemed genuine asylum seekers, then they have the right of appeal. It takes 18 months to, there's a huge backlog of these people. You see, there's a hundred, over 100,000 backlog of these people in Edmonton, Britain. Um, <clears throat> they, uh, then they were, even once the 18 months, so then eventually they had, it's heard, it, it's turned down. Then they can appeal, so there's another you know, a delay or something, and then by the time they've just vanished into the population or they found someone to marry, or, or they're just allowed to stay. So virtually all these people stay in practice. Hardly any of them are sent back. So, um, as I say, uh, you know, I even predicted civil war, which, as I say, I thought was back going. I, even I shared the views that this was rather extreme. But I think uh, if you think of civil war in the broad context, it is, it is correct to say that we are in a situation of civil war. It's not exactly like your American civil war, you know, or our English civil war of the 1640s, where the two armies lined up and come together and slog it out for a few hours, and a lot of people are killed, and one side wins. It's not exactly that kind of civil war. When you extend the concept, there's a lot of racial ki killings, you know, a lot of racially motivated attacks and killings. The police, uh, the white police, uh, are racially motivated and harass and uh, arrest the blacks and kill them. It's not infrequent in Britain for the police to, uh, well, I wouldn't say kill them, but uh, it's, not, it's not infrequent for blacks to die in prison. Black, da blacks die in prison much more commonly than whites do. And what typically has, happens is the police arrest a black and he bundle him into the black of a, their police van, take him off to prison, put him in the cell for the night. The next morning he's dead. And so some reason is found why he's dead. Uh, he struggled, so we had to, several of us had to get on top of him and sit on him and unhappily suffocated. That's the sort of story we get. And it's happening. The black community, of course, protests about this. But you know, this happens. So, I mean, this is a form of uh, low-level race warfare, I think, uh, civil, civil war. I think it's a useful concept that we are actually living in uh, a, a, a low-level civil war. We the same thing, I think, in jury, perverse jury trials, where uh, blacks yes, it get their own back by not, uh, not con bringing convictions against blacks, where the blacks are obviously guilty. Well, sometimes when I talk to my American friends, they say, well, America is in a pretty bad way. We all know from these census predictions that whites are going to go in a minority in about 50 years' time. The, um, the scenario for the future is not good in the States, but uh, it's, uh, Europe will remain uh, as a custodian of European civilization. So uh, we can look on the bright side, but I, I reluctantly come to the conclusion it's not like that. I think once, uh, the, I think immigration is unstoppable. The immigration of third world peoples into the West, I think, is unstoppable. As long as we retain democratic structures, there's no real way we can stop asylum seekers coming in. We've all signed the, agree the Geneva Convention, which says which we give refuge, we're willing to give refuge to asylum seekers. There's, uh, it's impossible to envisage that, that we, we will withdraw from our commitment there in any of the Western countries. There's no way we can stop illegals coming in I know you, many of my friends here talk about strengthening the fence along the Rio Grande and having more guards. I don't think that's going to be, do anything significant to stop the numbers of illegal immigrants. It's unstoppable. It's not feasible to identify them and deport them. Even if you do, they come back again. It's not feasible to stop these arranged marriages. That's the third loophole. So, uh, I feel I have a rather, I've come to a gloomy conclusion that the numbers of immigrants are going to grow indefinitely into the future. 
and uh, we in Europe too, and perhaps on a longer time scale than you in the United States, but we uh, Europeans in Europe are going to become a minority in our own country sometime towards the end of this century. Uh, will anyone with questions uh, please uh, address them to Professor Lin? Yes, uh, Israel defends its borders. Why can't we? Thank you. I don't really know the answer to that question. Um, it, it may be a smaller country to contain. It may be less people wish to go to. We have very, I mean, partly we're a magnet because of our high quality of life and our generous welfare provisions, I would think may well be a part of the answer to this. There are about three billion people in the third world who live in poverty, who would very much rather live on, in wel on welfare or working in low-level occupations in the advanced West, and they would uh, remain in their own countries. And um, so that's why it's unsolvable. I, really, I can't really tell you the answer to the Israel question, but... A comment there. I noticed that when um, Hitler tried to get Germany into England, the English were able to keep them out. So uh, it can be done physically under... Uh, very difficult circumstances even. But the question I had, I, I believe you said near the beginning, maybe I misheard you, that in Sweden uh, about 12% of the population were immigrants. Is that, did I hear that correctly? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Are you inviting people to... We, 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 yes. How optimistic are you about designer children? Desi the question is about designer children. This is genetically engineering our own children. Well, I'm quite uh, optimistic about that. I mean, I approve of it, so I'm saying I'm optimistic. But I think it's inevitable. We have the technology to uh, potentially, and to some degree actually, to um, diagnose genetically the uh, genetic qualities of an embryo and um, to select which one is going to be, this is done through in vitro fertilization, to select which one will be implanted and which one won't be and therefore to um, engage in producing a designer child. This is, this is already done quite extensively in the advanced world as a way of screening out children with genetic diseases. Um, you simply diagnose, you simply fertilize um, 10 or so of these uh, over and grow 10 or, 10 or so embryos and diagnose them genetically and to implant ones with a health, healthy. And I think it's inevitable, never mind whether you approve it or not, I think it's inevitable that this will come to be done for intelligence and personality characteristics, perhaps for physical characteristics, beauty, physical, um, height, things of that kind. It will, this will evolve spontaneously in the West, I think, through the market. Um, clinics will be set out to provide this um, facility and the couples will adopt them. Um, immigration before 1965, when we were closer to limited constitutional government than we are now, I don't understand why we can't do it again and still maintain a limited constitutional government. <clears throat> well, I hope you're right, and uh, I'm unduly, I mean, I very much hope you're right, and, we are, and I'm being unduly pessimistic about this, but I think this snowballs up, you know, as it gets, as it gets known in the third world, through family networks, it becomes known that it's easy to get into the advanced world and you can then live on welfare or in the underground economy, or you can even work. And it's very much better than life in your own countries. And um, this wasn't known so much in the 50s and 60s. Um, and there was less of an immigrant community which these people could join. As they, as they, uh, when, when these immigrant communities are, are extensive and well established in our countries, then these people can go into these communities and they have a social and support network much more easily than they can when there are relatively a few of them. So, um, well, that, uh, I'm sorry, that's the end of our, our time for this first speaker.